your voice up and speak into the microphones so that the stenographer can uh, hear you for the transcript. Uh, is your full name David William Donald Cameron? Yes. Uh, you were leader of the Conservative Party and leader of the opposition from 2005 uh, until 2010 when you became Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, leading a coalition government with the Liberal Democrats, with Nick Clegg as your Deputy Prime Minister and George Osborne as your Chancellor. Yes. Uh, to put that in context, you <coughs> became Prime Minister in the wake of the 2008 global financial crisis. Uh, and you um, remained Prime Minister in 2015 when the Conservatives won the general election and you formed a Conservative government. Um, in 2016, you stood down following the European Union exit referendum result. Now, your evidence this morning is going to fall uh, under four topics. First, the architecture in place to deal with large-scale emergencies in 2010 and changes implemented during your time in office. Two, the state of pandemic preparedness before and during your tenure. Three, your concerns around the World Health Organization. And four, the impact of austerity on the health and social care service and underlying health inequalities. First of all, please can we have on the screen your witness statement, which is at INQ 00017808. Can you confirm, please, Mr Cameron, that this is your witness statement and it's made true to the best of your knowledge and belief? Yeah, yes, it is. Yes, I can. Thank you. Um, for the record, it is, in fact, signed at page 19, but that signature has been <coughs> redacted, my lady, so we don't need to go to that. Thank you. Um, we can take that down, please. So dealing first of all, please, Mr Cameron, with the architecture in place to deal with large-scale emergencies in 2010 and changes implemented during your time in office. When you became Prime Minister in 2010, you tell us in your witness statement that, in your opinion, the existing architecture to deal with large-scale emergencies such as pandemics, derived in large part from the Civil Contingencies Act of 2004, and since 2008 had included the National Risk Assessment and the National Risk Register Assessment. So by architecture, uh, you mean framework, including legislation? Yes. Yes. But before coming uh, into power, your sense whilst in opposition was that whilst the National Risk Register was a welcome innovation, the overall architecture for dealing with civil contingencies such as pandemics and the national security machine more widely could benefit, in your view, from improvement. In what ways did you think it should be improved? Um, well, I commissioned Pauline Neville-Jones, um, who had been head of the Joint Intelligence um, Committee, to write a report on national security and foreign policy in opposition. And one of the recommendations she made was to have a sort of full-on national security council, to have a national security advisor, to have a national security secretariat. And the point was to, first of all, make sure that the whole government looked at these um, risks. Second, to make sure there was sort of real ministerial oversight because the National Security Council would be chaired by the Prime Minister. Um, third, to make sure that it was more strategic, thinking right across the board about all the risks, and also making sure it was truly international. So you were looking at risks of terrorism and climate change and space weather and all sorts of things, but also things like um, pandemics. And why I particularly thought this was important was while I think the Civil Contingencies um, Act and the previous government had done a good job in this regard, I knew that um, prime ministers are always in danger of being pulled into the short term rather than the long term. And having a National Security Council that you chair and a National Security Advisor um, and having as part of that looking at the danger of things like pandemics and, and, and it would make sure you did focus on those long-term things as well. So that was the point of the reform and I, I, I think it worked. I really, I like the way the National Security Council and the advisor worked and the, the time the Prime Minister spent on that stuff because um, it, it had a good structure. And you implemented those recommendations um, as soon as you came into office? 
That's right. I mean, it was, we were in the middle of the Afghan conflict, and I, I thought, for instance, we would handle that conflict better if we had a whole government approach and if the National Security Council could address the challenges and you'd have round the table all the relevant people, whether it was the Defence Secretary, the Aid Secretary, uh, the Energy Secretary, the Home Secretary, and the Prime Minister. Um, and it, it, why I think it's so important is, um, while of course Prime Ministers are very powerful because they're Prime Ministers, they don't have a department in the same way that other Ministers do. And having the National Security Advisor and the National Security Secretariat working for you and bringing together the whole of government to address these challenges, um, I thought got politicians involved at the highest level and the right level to make sure this was being looked at properly. So a, a National Security Council, as you've described, supported by a National Security Secretariat and a National Security Advisor. That's right. And the National Security Advisor had deputies, one of whom was mostly concerned with intelligence and terrorism and security, um, and, and the other more with, with, with foreign policy, but specifically part of the um, uh, job of the National Security Advisor, together with the National Risk Register and, and, and the National Security Secretariat, was to look at all the potential risks. And um, you know, it's important that we did make um, uh, a pandemic a health pandemic, a tier one risk. So it was about looking across the risks and saying which are the most likely, which are the ones we need to prepare for the most. And as I say, this, this pressure always to look at the most pressing risk, the, the terrorism risk, or the most dangerous risk, or the most immediate risk, you need to balance that with making sure you're looking at all the risks, including ones that might not occur next month or next year, but might occur at some stage. And that's why I think this, this reform was, was important. I'm not saying these things weren't looked at before, of, of course they were, but this embedded in the system um, prime ministerial leadership and political oversight and a whole government approach. Thank you. Now, the future of the risk of a future pandemic was, as you've already made reference to, prioritised <coughs> as a tier one risk and remained as such, did it not, throughout your time in office, w one of the highest risks um, that the United Kingdom faced. Um, and although um, you tell us at paragraph 12 in your report that, that, um, that it was a pandemic that was prioritised as a tier one risk, in fact, it, it was more discreet than that. It was an influenza pandemic, wasn't it? Um, that, that's right. I mean, I, I think um, I'm just maybe getting ahead of myself. But when, you know, when I look at all of this and read all the papers and thought so much about you know, what subsequently happened and the, the, the horrors of the COVID um, pandemic. And, you know, let me say the massive sympathy I feel for all those who've lost loved ones and for the suffering people have felt and the importance of this inquiry's work to get to the bottom of, you know, the decisions that were made, decisions that could have been made and the preparations for the future. Um, you know, this is the thing I keep coming back to, which is it, the pandemic was a tier one risk Pandemics were looked at, but there was this, um, the former medical, chief medical officer, Sally Davis, has said it was a group thing. It, much more time was spent on pandemic flu um, and the dangers of pandemic flu rather than on um, pandemic, potential pandemics of other um, more respiratory diseases like COVID turned out to be. And, yes. you know, I think this is... This is so important because so many consequences follow from that. Um, and I've been sort of wrestling with, well, why, you know, I think the architecture was good. National Security Council, National Security Advisor, the risk register, and also this new security risk um, assessment, which was a, perhaps a bit more dynamic. Um, but that's what I keep coming back to is so much time was spent on a pandemic influenza, and that was seen as the greatest danger, and it We've had flus, we have very bad years for flus, so it is a big danger, but why wasn't more time uh, and more questions asked about um, what turned out to be the pandemic that we faced? And uh, I, it's, it's very hard to answer why that's the case, and I, I'm sure this public inquiry is going to spend a lot of time on that. Yes, because during your time in office, 
Um, there were several outbreaks of other coronaviruses across the world, weren't yes. there? This inquiry has heard about um, multiple outbreaks of SARS and MERS, both of which are, were coronaviruses. Um, I'd like to put on screen, please, um, the following document, INQ 00114916, which is a, a note of a meeting of experts, including Professor Mark Woolhouse at the University of Edinburgh and also uh, Dame Sally Davis. And could we go to page two, please, because under the heading Clear and Present Danger, if we can highlight the third paragraph, we can see it in fact, Corona Viridae, including the severe respiratory infections, SARS-CoV and MERS-CoV. We note that although there are not currently any vaccines available against human coronaviruses, there are vaccines for animal coronaviruses. Now, this was a note from a, a meeting in March of 2015 when you were still um, in office, uh, a, a meeting chaired by um, the former uh, Chief Medical Officer Dame Sally Davis, to whom you've just made reference. Mm. Do you remember, Mr. Cameron, and if this assessment of coronaviruses as posing a clear and present danger was brought to your attention by the Chief Medical Officer in March of 2015? I'm, I'm afraid I don't recall a specific conversation. Um, but, and it's difficult, this, because, you know, you're trying to remember, you know, conversations you had or didn't have seven years ago. And, of course... Before this inquiry, I've read all of this documentation. And obviously in the documentation, there is, and the government did look at, SARS and MERS, um, and particularly there's Operation Alice in yes. 2016, we'll to which we, I'm sure we'll come to. But in terms of the specific conversation, I don't remember that. Um, I would certainly say that my relationship with the chief medical officer was very strong and we met quite regularly and because of the experience with Ebola, which I'm sure we'll also come on to, yes. I think this was a government and a prime minister that was very concerned about potential pandemics and about dangerous pathogens and about things like antimicrobial resistance and, and all the rest of it. So we weren't backward in thinking about it, um, uh, but it still comes back to this issue. Um, why so much time was spent on a flu pandemic and not so much on these others. Although, having said that, you know, the MERS um, exercise in 2016, that was looking at a respiratory um, condition. Yes, well, we'll, we'll yeah, come Yeah, sorry, to that okay, in I'm, a I'm, I'm, yeah. yeah. Not, not at all. Well, you've mentioned Ebola there, Mr. Cameron, and indeed you were <clears throat> alive to the dangers that that, that that disease or, or a similar disease mm. with high transmissibility and, and high mortality rates posed. And in the... Wait, so for, sorry, sorry to interrupt. I think the point about Ebola, though, it was not... It's, it's less transmissible, but it's, it's highly lethal. And I think that... Um, so we've been looking at pandemic flu. We had a plan for pandemic flu. We'd obviously wrote about, in the National Risk Registers, SARS and MERS. Ebola comes along, which is not that transmissible, but highly deadly. And so you, you're, you know, I think the question I keep coming back to is, why, wasn't, why weren't more questions asked about something that was highly transmissible, indeed with massive levels of asymptomatic transmission, yes. which, which was lethal, but at a lower level than either MERS or Ebola? And I don't have an answer to that question, but that, that's clearly where the gap was. Well, so concerned were you about the Ebola crisis that you created a, a, a new body, didn't you, a threats body, the NSCTHRC, which is a rather clunky initialism for the National Security Council Threats, Hazards, Resilience and Contingency Committee. Yes. I thought and, that predated Ebola, but I may be... Well, I... I, I, I Forgive me, I think in your witness statement you tell us that it was, it was formulated partly as a result of the Ebola crisis. And in addition to which, you also formed a, a, a horizon scanning um, committee, um, both of which um, were uh, run by Oliver Letwin. Um, and Oliver Letwin was, as you say in your witness statement, in many ways your resilience minister. Um, why did you think it was necessary to establish the, the Threats Committee and the Horizon Scanning uh, Department? Um, I thought the Threats um, 
has its resilience committee. I think it was set up before Ebola, but I have to check that. The reason for that was, as I said a bit earlier, um, clearly the National Security Council was spending a lot of time on terrorism, on security, on Afghanistan, on Libya and Syria, um, and things like that. And so I thought it was important to make sure that the National Security Secretariat and the politicians in the government spent time on hazards, threats, things like pandemics and other such um, things that were less immediate and current, but otherwise you spend all your time on the other things. So that's why THRC was set up. Oliver was an extremely capable um, minister and had worked in government before and was in the cabinet office and sat on the National Security Council. So I knew he'd do a great job at, 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 at uh, chairing that and, and running that. And then, as you say, after Ebola, um, he suggested, and I think the letter to me is in the bundle somewhere. Yes, we're going to come to that. In fact, yeah. can we put that on screen now, please? INQ 00001 17451. Now, this is, in fact, the contingencies um, forward look, because the, the Threats Committee, uh, as you explain in your statement, um, had a six-month um, forward look, didn't it, which was a much shorter term to when compared to the National Risk Register, which was five years, and the National Security Risk Assessment, which had a 20-year timeline. Uh, and this is, is one of the updates which, uh, as, um, as, as the man in charge of, of the Threats Committee, he would give to you. Can we look at page 22, please, and paragraph 6.2? And then we'll come on to the letter in a moment. Now, paragraph 6.2, we can see here um, an outbreak of a novel strain of an infectious disease causing, ca causing serious illness, excluding pandemics, it is raised within this forward look. And he tells you here that the risk of an emerging infection <laughs> becoming prominent is always present, particularly at the interface between animals and humans, i.e. zoonotic infections. Globally, there are currently three main areas of concern. The ongoing cases of MERS-CoV in the Middle East and Eastern Asia, the large number of avian and human cases of influenza, particularly in Egypt, and the epidemic of Ebola virus disease, EVD, in West Africa. Um, now, we, we, we can take that down, please, and, and can we go to the letter which you've made mention of, Mr Cameron, which is at INQ 00001461550. This was a letter sent to you by Oliver Letwin the following year. We can see that it's dated the 22nd of March of 2016. Uh, and uh, we can read through this together. It's titled Horizon Scanning for International Health Risks. Diseases like Ebola and Zika can constitute major risks to our national security. I have therefore asked the Civil Contingencies Secretariat to develop a new scanning system for international health risks. So this is the Horizon yep. Scanning Group. The results of this work have now been agreed with all relevant departments and have been endorsed by the Chief Medical Officer. I'm confident that the new system will enable ministers to spot major emerging diseases across the world, understand the direct risks to the UK, British nationals and broader UK interests in affected countries, and receive expert advice on clear and flexible UK responses and mitigation arrangements. A monthly report will be issued to the Health Secretary, the International Development Secretary and me. This will outline key international health risks, departmental assessments of the impacts and actions to mitigate the risks. I have asked the Chief Medical Officer to approve each monthly report before it is presented and attached as an illustrative example of the report for your reference. To avoid this becoming just business as usual, I suggest, rather than sending these reports each month to the NSC THRC, I shall write whenever officials have flagged a health risk of particular concern. And then he goes on to, to talk about the implementation in April. Mm. So, were you concerned, Mr Cameron, that, that rather than using this as an example, um, these bodies which you set up um, extending pandemic preparedness to a whole government um, procedure, that, that what this was doing was encouraging um, working in a silo so that fewer people, rather than larger departments, w were going to be involved. Oh, no, no, not at all. I think this was a really excellent idea of Oliver's, and I think it came out of um, 
Ebola because we'll come on to the World Health Organization, I'm sure, you know, I don't think there really was very timely information coming out of the WHO about Ebola. And this was Oliver saying, let's have our own horizon scanning to look across the globe for emerging problems. And the next one that comes along, of course, is the Zika virus. And this the horizon scanning unit spots that quite early. And then there are conversations in government. So no, I think this was saying, we can make the national security architecture work even better if we scan the horizons and look for novel pathogens and problems coming down the tracks. And I think that was a thoroughly good thing. I don't know what happened to this organization after I left, um, whether it continued, but I think this was a really good idea. And I think it, I don't think it was silo, it was in a silo at all. All right. Well, I'd like to ask you some questions about um, placing Mr. Letwin in charge. You deal with this at paragraph 21 of your witness statement in which you say, in terms of oversight of our resilience planning, I found that civil servants were very good at enumerating risks, setting them out and getting them in the right order. However, to get follow-on action, I tended to use very strong ministers in the Cabinet Office. And you say that in addition to Oliver Letwin, you also had Francis Maud, who were both very senior and experienced ministers driving change and action on those fronts. It may be suggested by others to this inquiry that rather than having a minister in charge of resilience, there should be an independent assessor, so somebody independent of government responsible for resilience who might be an expert and be able to dedicate himself or herself full-time to the role and effectively be beyond the civil service. What's your view of that, Mr I, Cameron? I don't think they're alternatives. I think they should be complements. Um, as I said, I had the National security advisor with his deputies, um, but the idea of having someone equivalent to that who's in charge of resilience and threats and hazards in the, at the civil service level, I think is an excellent idea, and I think the government themselves have suggested that. I personally would keep that in the National um, Security Council architecture, but then you do need um, a minister uh, to take responsibility for, for two reasons. One. Otherwise, there's a danger that the ministers around the cabinet table will just think, well, threats and hazards and resilience, that's taken care of someone, but someone else somewhere else, so a civil servant. And so they won't spend time on it. And the second is the reason I give in my statement, which is not in any way to denigrate the incredible work civil servants do, but I think ministers often come at these problems on a committee asking the question, right, here's the information. What are we going to do? What are the actions we're going to take? What's the outcome of this meeting? What are we actually going to do that's different? And I found that, maybe we'll come on to COBRA, chairing COBRA as often as I did. That, I think, is what the prime minister or another politicians bring is, is, yes, here's all the information. Here's what we need to communicate it to all the right people to make sure everyone is across it. But what's the action? What are we going to do? And I think it would be a mistake to park resilience at the official level and not have senior politicians, including the Prime Minister, at the National Security Council discussing it. I mean, for, for instance, when we did the National Security Risk Assessment, that assessment came to the National Security Council. I can't remember the date of the meeting, but I absolutely remember sitting around the table debating with the Secretary of State for Home Affairs and Foreign Affairs and, and Defence and all the rest of it, which risks should be where, you know, have we got this right? And that that, by its very act, you're getting people who don't think every day about pandemic preparedness and the importance of pandemics and other things that can, can happen to focus on those things as well as the terrorism yes. and the foreign affairs. And, yeah. You've explained why you chose Oliver Letwin and the qualities that he had uh, to be placed um, in the shoes of, effectively, the resilience minister. Um, and you would, of course, um, expect him as resilience minister to... Uh, deal with uh, the threat which uh, had been already assessed as a tier one threat, that is yeah. pandemics. Um, so I'd just like to, to look, please, at uh, Mr. Letwin's witness statement. It's at INQ 00017810. And can we go, please, to page two and highlight... Um, the first part of, of paragraph six, down to and including um, the, um, the words much less well prepared halfway down. Can we zoom in, please, and highlight that? Thank you. 
He says, during this period, 2011 to 2016, I was not directly involved in planning for the government's response to pandemic influenza in the UK. In retrospect, it may seem surprising that my resilience reviews did not cover this issue, given the fact that pandemic influenza was ranked high, both in terms of impact and in terms of likelihood on the National Risk Register. The reason, that I, the reason was that I was informed by Cabinet Office officials when I initiated the resilience review process in 2012 that an unusually large amount of attention had already been focused on this particular threat because of its position in the National Risk Register. That, as a result, the UK was particularly well prepared to deal with pandemic influenza, that the Department of Health was preparing to carry out a major exercise to test our national capabilities in the face of pandemic influenza, and that my time would therefore be better spent examining other whole, risk, whole system risks for which line departments might be much less well prepared. And could we go, please, to the next paragraph and highlight paragraph seven, please? Reflecting on that, Mr. Letwin goes on to say, I now believe, however, that it might have been helpful if I had delved into the pandemic influenza risk for myself, notwithstanding the amount of attention being focused on this issue by the line department and the consequently high level of preparations for responding to it. This is not because I believe such a review would have been likely to lead to any significant improvements in our preparedness for a pandemic flu itself, but rather because it might have led me to question whether we were adequately prepared to deal with the risks of forms of respiratory disease other than pandemic influenza. Are you surprised, Mr Cameron, that Mr Letwin, in the shoes of a resilience minister, did not uh, perform any tasks in relation to um, the tier one risk of, of pandemic influenza? Um, well, I think he, he explains it, really, which is that um, this was a, a risk that he was told that was already well covered because there was already a pandemic um, preparedness plan. Um, but I, I must say, I thought his statement was incredibly clear. And I think his, he's being very frank here and saying, you know, the more people who were in there questioning what sort of pandemics we might have, the better. And I think his suggestion about having a sort of red team to challenge, whatever architecture you build, it's only as good as the people within the building and the decisions they make. And his idea of having sort of red team to challenge the thinking, I think is an excellent one, because as Sally Davis has said, there is always a danger of, of groupthink. And, and perhaps that's what was happening here, is that we were so focused, or the system was so focused on pandemic influenza because of the well-known risks of it, um, that the system had got itself into a belief that that was the most likely pandemic and that was the one that needed to be prepared for. And so I think Oliver's statement is, is very powerful. So you don't think, as Resilience Minister, ignoring this risk, he let you down? I don't think he was ignoring it. Or, 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 I don't think he was ignoring it. He, he was doing the work on other risks because this one already had a plan. Some of the other things he was looking at, catastrophic failure of power grids, breakdown of the internet, you know, some even quite... Um, space weather and slightly more wacky things had had almost no attention. He thought they needed to have that attention. So no, I, I never felt Oliver let me down. All right. I, I want to move on to the second area of questioning now, the state of preparedness immediately before and during your tenure. So w within a couple of months of you taking up residence in Downing Street, um, Dame Deirdre Hine produced her report on the government's response to the 2009 swine flu uh, pandemic, which included 28 recommendations. Just to, to remind ourselves about swine flu, it hit the world in 2009. It was a, an influenza virus, a respiratory disease, causing just under half a million global cases uh, and uh, 18 and a half thousand deaths worldwide, with a fatality rate of between 0.01 and 0.2 percent, and causing sadly 457 deaths in the United Kingdom. Uh, you were aware of this report, were you not, Mr Cameron? Um, yes, I can't, yes. Re I can't remember the exact circumstances of when I was told about it, but yes, and obviously I've, I've, I've read it subsequently. Thank you. Can we put it up, please, on screen? INQ 00035085. And we can go, please, to page 96, paragraph 3, 
5.38. Thank you. Uh, the national framework was designed to prepare the UK for a variety of pandemic scenarios up to and including a reasonable worst case in which the clinical attack rate reached 50% and the case fatality rate re reached 2.5%. In late April, the limited information coming from Mexico gave cause for considerable concern, but as the pandemic progressed, it gradually became clear that a scenario approaching that scale was unlikely. A number of contributors to this review have noted that it was difficult to switch from the plan we had uh, predicated on a, worst, on a worse pandemic than that which emerged to a more proportionate response. And can we now go please to page 63, and highlight paragraph 3.65, dealing with uh, the worst case. Thank you. Top of the page. The worst case in the planning framework is for 750,000 additional deaths. Given pressures on resources, ministers will need to consider whether they wish to make any additional investment required to cope with the full worst case scenario. I have no recommendation to make on what the correct figure might be for the worst case scenario, although in Chapter 4 I have recommended that the Government Chief Scientific Advisor convene a working group to review the calculation of planning scenarios. However, I do believe that it would be unsatisfactory if the national framework implied that government and local responders were prepared to cope with many more thousands of deaths than they were in fact equipped to handle. Are you aware, Mr Cameron, we can take that down please, that these worst case scenario figures that a pandemic could affect 50% of the population, it could kill 2.5% of the population, and assuming a population of around 65 million in 2015, that would equate to infecting 32,500 people and causing around 800 deaths. Those figures remained in place and indeed formed the basis of the United Kingdom influenza pandemic preparedness strategy the following year and remained in place until COVID hit. They, I, were, never, they were never yes. amended. I... I if you ask me, was I, I mean, the trouble is I can't remember exactly what I was told at the time. Um, You've seen the report now, though. I've seen the report now, yes. Th th those figures were never altered during your time I in office. And, and as far as the inquiry is aware, uh, although there were moves to update the 2011 strategy much closer to the pandemic hitting, in fact, um, those matters were never dealt with. Do you, do you consider that that was a mistake? Well, I think it was a mistake not to look at, um, you know, repeating myself slightly, not to look at, not to look more at the range of different types of pandemic. Um, my reaction to reading Hein was, um, it, like many of the other reports, it doesn't mention the potential for asymptomatic transmission. And so, you know, when you when you think what would be different if more time had been spent on a high infectious asymptomatic pandemic, um, different recommendations would have been made about what was necessary to prepare for. That, that's what I think is, 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 is my focus. In, ter in terms of um, focusing on a, a pandemic other than influenza, it, yeah. it's right that the strategy in 2011 uh, states as follows, plans for responding to a future pandemic should therefore be flexible and adaptable for a wide range of yes. scenarios. So, so that was acknowledged, but, but, but nothing uh, appears to have been done. Uh, no, no further papers were prepared or, or exercises um, undertaken to... To, to, to say how uh, the, the, the strategy should be well, uh, adapted, no, that, no, no practical solutions. Well, there were other exercises undertaken, like Alice, which was looking well, we'll at MERS. Well, we'll come to that in a moment. Yeah, but, yeah. So, so other... It, it, I don't think it's right to say um, the government only looked at pandemic flu, it didn't look at other things. The risk registers and other documents mentioned MERS and SARS and yes. other types of pandemics. So I think that wasn't a failing. I think the failing was to not to ask more questions about asymptomatic transmission, high, highly infectious, what, what, what turned out to be um, the pandemic we had. And I think there are occasions where reading these reports, 
you, you can see was there was there adequate follow up um, yes. to to some of the work. Um, I spotted that in one or two places. Yes. Well. I want to come back to Ebola, please. Um, I don't know if you heard the um, opening statements to this inquiry, but Pete Weatherby King's Council, on behalf of the COVID-19 Bereaved Families for Justice UK, began with, with your words. Uh, and I'd like to uh, display, please, INQ 0001465. And this is the press release from June of 2015, um, when you were speaking ahead of the G7 summit in um, Germany on um, the, the wake-up to the threat from disease outbreak. Can we go, please, to page two? And we'll go straight to your words, please, at the bottom of the page, uh, where we can see that in this press release um, recorded uh, is the following. Speaking ahead of the G7, the Prime Minister, David Cameron, said... The recent Ebola outbreak was a shocking reminder of the threat we all face from a disease outbreak. Despite the high number of deaths and devastation to the region, we got on the right side of it this time, thanks to the tireless efforts of local and international health workers. But the reality is that we will face an outbreak like Ebola again, and that virus, that virus could be more aggressive and more difficult to contain. It is time to wake up to the threat, and I will be raising this... Um, issue at the G7. As a world, we must be far better prepared with better research, more drug development, and a faster and more comprehensive approach to how we fight these things uh, when they hit. And indeed, your plan that you set out um, it included a UK vaccines research and development network with £20 million mm. invested from the outset, and also a, what you described as a rapid reaction unit mm. uh, ready to deploy to help countries uh, suffering um, such um, uh, devastating epidemics in the future. Was your warning that Ebola was a wake-up call uh, based on your understanding of, of the effects that Ebola had had uh, and, um, and uh, a concern as to how uh, the global community could improve for next time? Yes. I mean, I, I, you know, the reason I chose to rose that, rise that, raise that at the G7 was I, I had become really concerned about this whole issue and Ebola was you know one example of it and it was through conversations with Dame Sally Davis and others um, that I became more and more interested in this you know I thought we had taken important steps at home and this was a you know genuinely trying to put on the table the UK vaccine network and the the rapid reaction force that you you mentioned say that these were going to be our contributions yes. as well as this horizon scanning unit so I thought we were putting in place good steps uh, and it was important to say to other countries um, we all need to do this because with Ebola specifically um, th there was this sense that uh, A, the WHO was quite slow to announce that it was happening, also quite slow to ask for help and the, the help that was given to Sierra Leone, um, to, to, to Guinea and to Liberia was very much ad hoc. It, I think I put it in my statement. It was at a meeting, it was at a NATO summit. I was sitting next to Obama, and he said, look, the world's being too slow on this. We'll help with Liberia. Can you help with Sierra, Sierra Leone? Can the French help with Guinea? And it was quite an ad hoc response that led to this. I mean, we spent half a billion pounds um, sending troops and nurses and all, all the rest of it, and I think they did a magnificent job. Um, but it was quite ad hoc. And so it made me think that we needed to, put, again, the international architecture was lacking and we needed to put it in place. And that's what this press release and that announcement was about. Yes, thank you. Um, I'm going to now turn to two um, exercises, UK exercises, um, one of which you've already made mention of, Exercise Alice, which took place in February of 2016. Um, and the hypothetical scenario of this exercise was an outbreak of the MERS coronavirus in March of 2016, 
having been reported to the World Health Organization and caused about 500 deaths, most cases ha having occurred in the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. This was a tabletop exercise, as the inquiry has already heard, involving the Department of Health, as it then was, uh, the NHS and Public Health England. And it was commissioned by the Department of Health in response to concerns raised by uh, Dame Sally Davis about planning and resilience in response to a major outbreak of MERS in England. Um, the Cabinet Office um, it is described in the report as having observer status. Um, so, so does that mean that, that the Cabinet Office was not um, actively involved but was there in order to, to, to observe? I'm afraid I, I don't know the answer to that question. I mean, I think that these exercises are, are good and it's important they take place. I think Oliver Letwin's evidence about they should happen with great regularity and at a senior level, I think is, is absolutely right. Because yes. as I said earlier, you want in the end to have ministers asking questions about, right, well, what will we actually do? What needs to change? What needs to be put in place? Um, and you want their attention to be focused on, on, on this. Yes. Um, well, let's have a look, please, at the recommendations of Exercise Alice. Uh, and they are in document INQ 00056239. Thank you. And if we can go to page 16, please. Here we are. The, the page of summary of lessons and actions identified. I'm just going to read through a few of these. At number one, the development of mers cov special instructional video on PPE level and use. At number four, to develop a mers cov serology assay procedure, that's blood test searching for antibodies, um, to include a plan for a process to scale up capacity. At number seven, to produce an options plan using extant evidence and cost benefits for quarantine versus self-isolation for a range of contact types, including symptomatic, asymptomatic and high-risk groups. And just going back a little further up the page to number five, to produce a briefing paper on the South Korea outbreak with details on the cases and response and consider the direct application to the UK, including port of entry screening. Now, you may uh, be aware that uh, Professor Heyman, the esteemed epidemiologist, gave evidence to the inquiry last Thursday, uh, and he told the inquiry that he thought that Recommendation 5 was an extremely good idea mm. to learn from the experiences of South Korea in terms of their response to MERS uh, and to see how those matters could be possibly adapted to the United Kingdom in the event of a, of a similar pandemic. Do you agree that that, that was... Um, a useful and important recommendation. Yes, I, I do. And, I mean, I think it's... it's Having read through now, Alice, I, I, um, because ministers weren't involved... Yes. But, you know, there's, there's a sentence in, 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 in Alice which is, access to sufficient levels of PPE was also considered and pandemic stockpiles were suggested. That, that's a sentence in Alice, but it doesn't make it into the recommendation. So, I mean, if you're asking whether, you know, failures, does it look like there were failures to follow through from this? Yes. I, I think the answer to that is, is yes. Thank you. At the same time, we can take that down please, there was another exercise being planned, Exercise Cygnus. Now, although this was not delivered by Public Health England until you had left office, um, it, in fact, it took place over two days between the 18th and 20th of October of 2016. Planning for this exercise began in 2014, but was postponed due to the Ebola response. Were you aware at the time that um, exercise sickness was being planned, Mr Cameron? I'm afraid I, I just don't recall. Um, I haven't, in the papers, I haven't yes. seen anything, sort of a note from an official saying there's this exercise going on. I mean, yes. I've seen notes of me saying to Jeremy Hunt, let's do a note on an exercise on Ebola. Yes. I do remember that, but I, I don't remember. That doesn't mean I didn't get a note about no. it, but I haven't been able to find one, and I don't think you, you, you have. All right. Well, um, we haven't, no. Um, but this was uh, an exercise designed to assess the UK's preparation and response to an influenza pandemic. The inquiry has heard about it already, and no doubt will continue so to do throughout the course of these public hearings. 
but it involved 950 representatives from the devolved administrations, the Department of Health, 12 other government departments, NHS Wales, NHS England, Public Health England, and eight local resilience forums, and six prisons uh, took part in the exercise. Huge, then, mm. in terms of uh, organisation. I'd like to look briefly, please, at some of the recommendations from this exercise, whilst acknowledging, again, that, that you had left office by the time this yeah. report um, was produced. Um, could we go, please, to page 30? Now, we can see that here we have the, lesson, the table of lessons identified. Uh, I'm going to move through these quite swiftly because the common theme of the recommendations that I'm going to highlight is capability and capacity in health and social care. Uh, so we can see at KL4, an effective response to pandemic influenza requires the capability and capacity to surge resources into key areas, which in some areas is currently lacking. LI5, please, further down the page. Further work is required. Where have we gone now? Further up the page, please, LI5. Thank you. Further work is required to inform consideration of the issues related to the possible use of population-based triage during a reasonable worst-case uh, influenza pandemic. LI16, please. Thank you. Expectations of the MOD's capacity to assist during a worst-case scenario influenza pandemic should be considered as part of a cross-government review of pandemic planning. LI 17, please. The process and timelines for providing uh, and best presenting data on which responders will make strategic decisions during an influenza pandemic uh, should be clarified. If we can have LI 18, please. A methodology for assessing social care capacity and surge capacity during a pandemic should be developed. This work should be conducted with directors of adult social services and with colleagues in the devolved administrations. And finally, LI20. Department of Health, NHS England, the CCS and the voluntary sector and relevant authorities in the devolved administration should work together to propose a method for mapping the capacity of and providing strategic national direction to voluntary resources during a pandemic. Given the experience of exercise Cygnus, it is recommended that this work draw on expertise of non-health departments and organisations at national and local level. Standing back for a moment, Mr Cameron, and considering that these recommendations were made in October of 2016, would you have expected the government to have implemented the lessons learned from Exercise Cygnus by January of 2020? Well, you would... You, I don't really want to comment on my successes, um, but, I mean, you would, you would hope so. I mean, I, I, I thought a lot about this because... You know, having been back through all the paperwork and, and everything, I, I haven't found any moment when I was asked or the Treasury was asked to approve sort of surge capacity for PPE supplies or anything like that. I think that's because there wasn't enough attention on the sort of pandemic that we ultimately experienced. But I hadn't, I haven't, I don't recall any recommendations like that. But these are, as you say, are quite clear. Um, and I, I think that... Um, the Treasury, while I'm sure we're going to come on to, money was tight and we made difficult decisions about public spending. When we did need to spend money on important priorities, when we had to spend money on Ebola, um, we did and we would. All right. Well, well be before we come to deal with um, austerity and the, the effects of that on health and public health, I'd just like to draw together... The, the, the lessons that, that we have just seen identified in these exercises. So in Exercise Alice, um, we saw recommendations of a need to plan for scaling up testing capacity for isolation and self-isolation options for asymptomatic transition and issues with the provision uh, of PPE. Do you know whether those matters were addressed during your time in office? Well, what I know is that there were, there was capacity um, for um, isolation um, when we had the Ebola outbreak in Africa, and obviously there were some cases in the UK. 
but you know, I would say that the the problem with Alice was that it was a a MERS outbreak with a very high degree of mortality, 35% mortality, but a very low caseload. And so, again, that wasn't anywhere close to the sort of pandemic we then actually experienced. By the time you left office, do you accept, Mr Cameron, that there had not been any planning um, specifically um, of the effect of a pandemic, and by that I mean this, there had been no planning, for instance, by the Department of Education about the impact of school closures, had there? Well, um, the fir- I, I, I don't know the answer to that. Um, somewhere in the bundle, there's mention of school closures, I think. Is it with respect to Signet? Um, but the, the, that certainly it, that it should be looked at, yes. yes it was raised as a point, recommendation. The, the, the point is, during my time in office, um, there, there were investigations into SARS, into SARS and MERS and other types of pandemic, including yes. Ebola, but there wasn't one into a highly transmissible coronavirus-style pandemic like we had, and so these questions weren't asked. But, but even in relation to an influenza pandemic, which had, as we have already established, yeah. been a tier one risk during your whole time in office. Um, here we have Exercise Cygnus reporting just after you've left office, saying that there should be um, plans and research into the effect of school closures um, in the, uh, in the um, event of a pandemic. That, that hadn't been done. It was being raised as a recommendation in Cygnus on your departure from office because that planning hadn't been done, had it? Well, it, had been, it was raised... That, that, as far as I can see, that's the first time it was raised. Yes. After I'd left office. Yes, which means that that type of planning was absent during your time in office. But it, I don't... I haven't seen a report while I was in office saying that sort of planning should be done because the pandemic preparedness plan, which had been worked up by the previous government and then amended and improved and enhanced during my time in office, there were lots of recommendations made and all sorts of things about stockpiles of Tamiflu and all the rest of it. Yes. But it didn't go into things like school closures. No. Had there been any planning of the economic, political and social consequences of the imposition of restrictions in the event of a pandemic? Um, Well, the answer to that is, first of all, our whole economic strategy was about safeguarding and strengthening the economy and the nation's finances so we could cope with whatever crisis hit us next. And I think that's incredibly important because there's no resilience without economic resilience, without financial resilience, without fiscal resilience. And so that was the absolutely line one of our plan for dealing with any unexpected um, crises. Um, Also, I think I'm right in saying that in the national risk registers in 2014 and subsequently, uh, there was quite a lot of examination of how to to respond to different um, uh, catastrophic economic problems that a, a that, that these sorts of pandemics would bring about. There, there were national there was national business resilience planning going through area by area, looking at what you might have to do. But I think all of those. I mean, a plan you know, is is only as good as the financial and economic capacity of a country to deliver it. And that was the most important thing of all. You've told the inquiry that, that as soon as you came into office in 2010 and you, and you um, made um, significant improvements to the architecture uh, of planning and resilience, that, that one of your major... Um, one of your one of your major intentions was that that would lead to a whole system yeah. level of preparedness. Do you accept that you failed in that in that desire? By the time you left government in 2016, uh, there wasn't wholesale preparation and resilience, was there? No, I, I don't accept that because we set up a much superior architecture for looking at risks, for judging risks, and planning for risks, and um, that's what the National Risk Register, the National Security Secretariat, the National Security Council did, and I think there was more attention, including more attention of senior politicians, onto those sorts of risks than there had been previously. But as I've said, um, the problem was that 
when pandemics were looked at, there was too much emphasis on pandemic flu. And when other pandemics were looked at, including Ebola, including MERS, they tended to be um, high fatality but low infection. And, you know, the regret, and you see it in, in Oliver Lechman's evidence, you see it in, in, in um, George Osborne's evidence, is more questions weren't asked about the sort of pandemic that we faced. But I think many other countries were in the same boat of not knowing what was coming. Um, but I would argue we did more than many to try and scan the horizon, to try and plan. Um, we did act on Ebola. We did carry out these exercises. We did try to change some of the international dynamic about these things. And we planned and prepared in accordance with that. The evidence uh, of uh, Mr. Mann and Professor, Professor Alexander that was received by uh, the inquiry last Thursday, it included them posing this question, who is in charge of keeping the country safe? What is your answer to that question? Well, the Prime Minister is always in charge of keeping the country safe. And under my reforms, the Prime Minister was much more actively involved because he was chairing the National Security Council. The National Security Advisor was appointed by him, reported to him. And in my case, I'd set up a specific subcommittee on threats, hazards and resilience that looked exactly at this area with a highly capable minister in. And I'm sure there are further improvements we can make. And the government has announced some which seem to me sensible with the proviso um, that I made. But at the pinnacle of it, must be the Prime Minister, because from all my experience of, of, of chairing Cobras, whether it was during uh, terrorist problems or Fukushima, nuclear disasters or Ebola or, or anything else, um, the system works extremely well, but the system works better when the Prime Minister is in the chair, asking questions, driving changes and making sure decisions are made. So my answer is it's the Prime Minister. Thank you. Um We've dealt with your concerns around the World Health Organization and how you sought to, to deal with those. So I'm, I'm now going to move on to the final area of questioning, the impact of austerity on the health and social care service and underlying health inequalities. And I'd like to display, please, um, paragraph 26 of uh, George Osborne's witness statement, which we have at INQ 0001873088. Paragraph 26, please. Next page, thank you. Reducing the deficit and placing debt as a percentage of the GDP on a downward path was also essential to rebuild fiscal space to provide scope to respond to future economic shocks. A responsible approach to repairing the UK's public finances following the financial crisis was essential. I have no doubt that taking those steps to repair the UK's public finances in the years following the financial crisis of 2008-2009 had a material and positive effect on the UK's ability to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. The most urgent task facing the UK economy, as stated in Budget 2010, was therefore to implement an accelerated plan to reduce the deficit. Indeed, there was cross-party consensus on the need to reduce the deficit following the financial crisis. And you've already made reference, Mr Cameron, um, to, to the need for this to happen, and in, in your view, um, for the positive effect that that had yeah. on the state of the country's finances going in to the um, going into the COVID-19 um, pandemic. I, I make it clear, we can take that down please, that the purpose of the following questions that I have for you is not to explore whether that policy was right or wrong. That is uh, no part of this inquiry to descend into those political areas. But what we are interested in are the impacts and consequences of that policy in three areas, please. Health, inequality and societal resistance. The Health and Social Care Act of 2012 um, 
changed the landscape of public health, did it not? Because it transferred to local authorities uh, public health features um, and um, the involvement of directors of public health. So from that time, from 2012, um, those areas of public health were no longer funded through the Department of Health in the way that they had been before. Um, Mr Osborne also says at paragraph 71 of his witness statement, we don't need to, to put this up, that um, the Department of Health's budget from 2011 to 2012 until 2014 to 2015 was to increase in real terms in each financial year and that that growth occurred in circumstances where all other departmental budgets other than overseas aid were cut by an average of 19% over the same period. Uh, he also goes on to say that in 2010, uh, the budget for public health was ring-fenced. But of course, as we've just um, discussed, uh, that was only relevant up to, to 2012, at which point in time uh, public health was no longer funded through uh, the Department of Health. D do you accept, Mr Cameron, that the health budgets over the time of your government uh, were inadequate and led to a depletion in its ability to provide an adequate service? Um, I, I don't accept that, um, neither on a sort of big picture level or yes. on a small picture level. I mean, the big picture level, I don't think you can separate the decision and the necessity of getting the budget deficit down and having a, a, a reasonable debt to GDP ratio so you can cope with future crises. I don't think you can separate that from um, the funding of the health service or indeed anything else. I mean, if you lose control of your debt and you lose control of your deficit and you lose control of your economy, you end up cutting the health service. That's what happened in Greece. That's what happened in countries that did lose control um, of their finances. So I don't think you can separate the two. So we made the important decision to say that the health service was different, its budget would be protected, and so there were real terms increases every year. And so, for instance, there were 10,000 more doctors working in the NHS at the end of the time I was Prime Minister than there were at the beginning. Um, <laughs> would everyone like to spend even more on the health service? Yes. There were, I mean, I, you know, making these difficult choices about spending was, was it wasn't a sort of option that, that was picked out of thin air, I believed, and I still believe it was absolutely essential to get the British economy and British public finances back to health, so you can cope with a future crisis. The, the inquiry has received witness statements from Jeremy Hunt, who was uh, the Secretary of State for Health, uh, and then Health and Social Care from 2012 to 2018. Um, were you aware uh, that during the time that, that you were in power, Mr Hunt um, laboured considerable concerns about the structural problems within a NHS capacity and the workforce and funding, as he has set out in his witness statement. I, I've read his witness statement. I, he was a, a very capable health secretary. I worked with him extremely closely. Um, of course, he was always um, batting for the NHS and for, um, for, for all the extra resources he could get. Um, these decisions were arrived at collectively. Um, I agree with a lot of what's in his witness statement, uh, you know, where he says there's more that could be done for, for instance, for future workforce planning. But I will absolutely defend the record of the government in both getting control of the finances and increasing funding for the health service at the same time. Aren't these concerns, Mr Cameron, uh, that, that Jeremy Hunt sets out, structural problems with the NHS uh, and workforce and capacity, the real issues which preparedness for a public health emergency needs to address, not papers and guidelines and protocols, but action to remedy fundamental problems? Well, I think what's needed to prepare for a pandemic is, is first of all, you've got to have that overall economic capacity, um, as George Osborne puts in his statement, without our action, you could have had almost a trillion of extra debt. And you'd have, as well as a coronavirus crisis and a public health crisis, you'd have a um, financial and economic and, and, and fiscal crisis at the same time. Um, but I, I think the, the answer to your question is that um, the best way to prepare is to have a strong economy. And the next thing you need to do is prepare for all of the relevant pandemics that you might face. And we've already discussed um, where, you know, the system, I think, didn't spend enough time on 
the sorts of pandemic that we did end up facing. Do you accept, Mr Cameron, that the government was repeatedly warned about growing pressures on the NHS? Firstly, uh, from the Nuffield Trust annual statement in 2015, um, which detailed growing concerns that demand was outstripping capacity and, quote, the warning lights on care quality now glow even more brightly. And finally, in 2016, in the Nuffield Trust annual statement before you left office, which stated slowing improvement in some areas of quality combined with longer waiting times and ongoing austerity suggests the NHS is heading for serious problems. It seems likely that a system under such immense pressure will be unable at some point in some services to provide care to the standards that patients and staff alike expect? Well, of course there were pressures on the NHS as there were pressures on many public services. But at the end of my time in office, um, I think public satisfaction with the National Health Service was still extremely high. Um, I think the King's Fund, it might have been, was ranking it as one of the most successful health systems in the world. We'd virtually abolished uh, mixed-sex wards. We'd got hospital infections down. We were carrying out 40% more diagnostic tests every week. There were successes in the NHS as well as pressures. But there are, you know, there are always pressures on these services. And uh, our job was to try and um, sort out the economy, which we did, so we could then have bigger increases in health spending, which then followed. In preparation for your evidence today, you were invited to consider the witness statement of Professor Kevin Fenton, uh, who is the president of the United Kingdom Faculty of Public Health, uh, which is a professional standards body for public health specialists and practitioners with over 4,000 members. Um, you will know then that, um, according to Professor Fenton, health protection teams saw successive reductions in funding and capacity over the pre-pandemic years and a lack of investment in regional emergency preparedness response and resilience teams. And the summary of his evidence as provided to the inquiry so far in written form is that there was no ring fencing of funding to local government for health protection, that health protection teams had their funding reduced and their capacity reduced, and that ultimately this resulted in a lack of capacity for pandemic preparedness. What's your response to that, please? Well, I read the Fenton report as the other reports. I, I thought... Um I, mean, I don't want to be too critical, but throughout all of them, I thought there was very little acceptance that it is possible to reform public sector organisations, uh, sometimes to merge them and get rid of duplicating bureaucracies and overheads and get more output for the same amount of money. I thought in, in Kershell, in Marmot, in, in Fenton, um, there was just this assumption that you only ever measure inputs rather than measuring outputs. So, for instance, I would say the creation of Public Health England, where a lot of it was merging together a lot of other bodies, increased the focus on public health, meant money was spent more wisely. And I would argue also that the um, Health and Social Care Act, by putting public health into local authorities, that was the right place for it. Local authorities are responsible for housing and for education and for licensing. And so making them responsible for public health is, is very logical. And even I think most of the experts coming to your inquiry, I don't think people are arguing to turn the clock back and put it into the health service. So I think these were good reforms. And yes, we faced very difficult financial circumstances. But where we could, we tried to encourage the spending of money more wisely. And sometimes the merging of public bodies was a sensible thing. But they don't seem to give that much credence. Well, you've mentioned the evidence of uh, Professor Sir Michael Marmot and Professor Claire Bambra. Um, you've clearly read their report, and uh, you will know that they gave evidence to this inquiry on Friday. Do you accept their evidence, Mr Cameron, that health inequalities increased during your time in office? Well, I, I accept... I mean, I've read their reports. Yes. Um, uh, I accept that after um, 2011... In lots of countries in the world, uh, life expectancy continued to improve, but didn't continue to improve so quickly. Um, now, their conclusion is to look a lot at um, austerity and, and what have you. Uh, I'm not sure the figures back that out. Um, we had some very difficult winters with very bad uh, flu pandemics. I think that had an effect. We had 
uh, the effect that the improvements in cardiovascular disease, the big benefits had already come through uh, before that period, and that was tailing off. And then you've got the evidence from other countries. I mean, Greece and Spain um, had far more austerity, brutal cuts, and yet their life expectancy went up. So I don't think it, it, it follows. And I found, you know, I mean, there's one sentence in in, in Amber and Marmot that just boldly says, you know, child poverty increased. Well, actually, the number of children living in absolute poverty went down. The number of people living in absolute poverty went down. The number of pensioners living in absolute poverty went down very considerably. So, I. I so you don't dis you don't I, agree with? I, well, I mean, they've got lots of important evidence, and I, I've looked at it very carefully, and I will think about it very carefully. But I did find the, the I found, found that they had leapt to a certain set of. Um, conclusions quite quickly, not all of which was backed up by the um, evidence. And they don't mention the evidence that I've just mentioned, which I think is quite important. Um, I mean, added to the fact that I agree with Professor Bamba that social and economic conditions have a big bearing on um, health inequalities, and so therefore the fact that there were 2.6 million more people in work, there were over half a million fewer children in households where no one worked, that these are, there were obviously a big dent in pensioner poverty because of the triple lock and the increase in the pension. Um, these are positives as well, which they don't seem to get mentioned in the same way. So I, I had my problems with them, but um, I'm sure the, the inquiry can look at, look at all the evidence and come to its conclusions. Do, do you accept that cuts to public health budgets tended to be largest in the most deprived areas and that as a result, local authorities working with the most vulnerable populations faced the biggest challenges in carrying out their public health functions? No, I, I don't necessarily accept that. The way um, the local authority spending decisions were made was to try and make sure that the reductions in spending power in each local authority were broadly equivalent. And obviously when you're looking at spending power, you've got to look at um, the grants uh, from central government to local government, the, the business rate um, revenue, and the council tax revenue. And so, for instance, I mean, I checked this last night, the 2015 settlement was for a, a, a no, no council should lose more than 6% of its spending power. Um, and so that does affect different councils in different ways in terms of their grant, but it affects them in a more similar way when it comes to spending power. And it's obviously the spending power that a council yes. has that matters, and I think that's a better way of measuring it. Right, but were you aware whilst <clears throat> in government of evidence that people from lower social economic groups and minority ethnic groups would be more likely to be affected by whole system <laughs> catastrophic shocks? I, I think it was well known, and I knew that when you have health pandemics of any sort, um, you get differential effects on different parts of the population. Yes. I think as coronavirus turned out, the biggest um, um, category, uh, that's the wrong word, the biggest impact was obviously on o older people. But many of our policies were directed towards lifting people out of poverty, the, the more jobs, um, the, the first national living wage, the big increase in the minimum wage, taking four million people out of paying income tax. All of these things, the reform, the universal credit and the reform of welfare and the whole effort of getting people out of welfare and into work, all of these things have an economic and social benefit but also have a health benefit too. The, the, the inquiry saw last Friday that pre-existing health inequalities only featured minimally in the UK pandemic planning. In fact, they were barely mentioned at all. Do you accept that this was a significant omission? I, I think all plans can be improved and updated, and I've read the evidence about that, and I'm sure future plans will. But if you're asking, was it, you know, was it, did you understand, um, did your government understand the importance of trying to lift people out of poverty and into work and into um, prosperity? Yes, absolutely. That's what the whole plan was about. And going back to this economic thing, because it is important, you know, over the period of my government in the G7 after America, we had fastest growth of GDP and fastest growth of GDP per head. So this is important because ultimately your health system is only as strong as your economy because one pays for the other. Do you agree that different political decisions will have to be made in the future if a strong public health system is to be nurtured to withstand another pandemic? I think different decisions, well, I think we need to improve the way we look at pandemics and the way we plan our resilience because while, as I've said, you know, the architecture was there, the structure was better, 
um, the involvement of ministers was better. Um, the dialogue between ministers and civil servants was good. There is this gap that I keep coming back to, which is uh, how do we make sure that you're not subject to group things, that you don't plan for one type of pandemic because it's very current, it's very risky, it's very dangerous. You need to have teams going in to question uh, the assumptions. And I mean, the biggest one was this issue about asymptomatic transmission. I kept looking through all these documents, looking for what about uh, a pandemic with wide scale asymptomatic transmission. And if, if that question had been asked, and a lot of things would follow from that, you know, in Jeremy Hunt's evidence, hospitals in Hong Kong had to have three months of PPE supplies. I was never asked, can we have funding for three months PPE supplies for every hospital? But had I been asked, we would have granted it. It's, it's, that's not expensive. That's not a huge commitment. But that comes out of planning for the right sort of pandemic. So I... You know, all these questions about economic policy, we can have an argument about, was it the right economic policy or wrong? I think it was the right economic policy, but the real problem was time spent quizzing the experts on what potential pandemics were coming um, and preparing for those in the right way and the questions that would follow from that. Thank you. My lady, that concludes my questions of, of Mr. Cameron. Um, I, I know that uh, prior to today, um, permission has, has, has been given to Miss Mitchell King's Council on behalf of Scottish COVID Bereaved Families for Justice to ask um, a, a short series of questions. Um, may she now be allowed to do that? Certainly, I would normally break now, but if I think the it's stenographer carry on from Miss Mitchell's questions. Yes. Thank you very much. Ms. Mitchell. Mr Cameron, I'm Senior Counsel instructed by Amaran Warren Company for the Scottish COVID Bereaved. You've made it clear both in your written evidence and your evidence here today that you understood that pandemics were a very real threat. And you might not have understood the phrase, or remembered the phrase, clear and present danger. But you would agree with me that as a tier one risk, it certainly was something that was immediate, important, and potentially grave in terms of risk. Yes. And we've also heard that given pandemics have happened throughout history, it was a matter of when and not if a pandemic would occur. Yes. Your, your language, indeed, we will face an outbreak like uh, Ebola, made it clear that you understood effectively that a pandemic was inevitable. Yes. You also uh, referred to it, I think, here and also in your statement about taking a longer term strategic view and trying to fix the roof while the sun is shining. Presumably because Whilst things are good, you put plans in place so that when the pandemic arrives, it will allow those to deal with it to weather the storm safely. Yes. Because presumably you appreciated that failure to properly plan would be likely to have a catastrophic effect for the United Kingdom. Yes. Can I ask you to look at the following document? It's document... INQ 00087193. And we're looking at page seven of that document. While we're waiting for that document to come up on screen, this is a document from the Public Accounts Committee of the House of Commons entitled The Whole of Government Response to COVID-19. Now, I'd like to draw your attention, please, I'll wait till it arrives on screen. Yep, to, to the heading Conclusions and Recommendations. My lady, I'm extremely sorry to have to get to my feet. Um, my lady friend knows very Could well. Could you get by the microphone, Mr. Keith, please? My lady friend knows very well that we're constrained by the, uh, the rules of parliamentary privilege not to be able to put parliamentary material, which includes NAO reports in a way which calls into debate the merits of whatever conclusions have been drawn by the particular parliamentary body or, or anything said, in fact, in the chamber. 
uh, of the House of Commons. So I'm just a bit concerned that we may be breaching parliamentary privilege by going down this line of examination. Well, th there's certainly um, a way, Milady, that I can ask the questions mm. um, without <coughs> having to refer to those documents. So I'll be able to do that in that way. And I'm obliged to my learned friend for highlighting that before uh, that route was gone down. Thank you. Well, while you were in government and when you were Prime Minister, did you make any plans for the effect economically on individuals in the United Kingdom? Well, I think as I answered earlier, there's the two answers to that. One is the biggest thing was to get the British economy and the public <laughs> finances in a state where they were capable of responding to the next crisis. Because just as I answered earlier, you know, we will have another pandemic. We will have another economic crisis of some sort, whether it's a recession or a banking crisis or a, a insurance, who knows what it will be. The question is, do you have the capacity, do you have the spare capacity to suddenly borrow another 10, 15, 20% of your GDP to help the country and help people through it? That's the key question. And that was very much in my mind when we drew up the plan to reduce the budget deficit and get the debt GDP ratio under control because that's the responsible thing to do. The second answer is that, as I think I said, in the national risk um, assessments, um, there's quite a lot of material about national business resilience planning, working out if you had a pandemic flu, and even with the, with the pandemic flu we were looking at, which would, would have had you know, hundreds of thousands of, of deaths and a huge effect on the economy, what do you do to help the various sectors of the economy to recover. So to that extent, yes, there was a plan. Well, your plan was about the country. What I was asking you about, and if I would ask you to focus on the question, yeah. was, was there a plan made for the economic impact on individuals during a pandemic? Well, until you know exactly what pandemic you face and whether you're going to need to um, have people at home so you have a furlough plan, or you're going to have to um, act in a different way and you might need to cut VAT or change tax rates or, you know, you need to have the, those decisions can be made very quickly as they were to the credit of the Chancellor when the pandemic hit, but you need to have the capacity in the economy to do it. You clearly understood that the effect of a pandemic might mean that people were sick and weren't able to attend work and businesses might have problems. Yes. Did you, while you were in government, put any plan, make any plans, have any conversations about what a furlough might look like, about what an economic plan might look like? Were those discussions had? Well, I, I can't remember every discussion I had, but I have seen that in the national risk assessments, those sorts of things are looked at. And obviously, in government, when we were looking at the threat of uh, pandemics or the threat of terrorist attacks uh, or the threat of something work you know a major terrorist attack that could take out a whole city what would you do in order to keep the economy going and help people yes there, we did have those conversations well I'm actually specifically asking about those not at the level that you're talking about I'm talking about the individuals who would not be able to go to work I'm talking about the businesses that needed to keep going, there were no concrete plans made for that, correct? Well, I mean, you keep asking me this. I mean, I think I have to go back over the national risk assessments. I think there were plan looking at individual um, sectors and businesses and what would have to be done. Um, so uh, I, but I, uh, maybe I can look at that again and, and, and give you a written answer because I, I <clears throat> I, I don't want to say there's something in them that there isn't, but I think they are. They do address some of these questions. I, I'm sure the inquiry would be greatly assisted if you can find anything in relation to the economic planning. Uh, um, uh, um, but as of at today's date, you can't think of anything. Well, I, I can, which is if you have a strong economy and good public finances, you can flex your tax, your benefit system, your spending, um, that you can, you have the enormous financial capacity of the British state to act and help people. 
We now know that over 227,000 people died from COVID and we've heard evidence that the UK was not prepared for a pandemic. We've heard evidence that after years of underfunding, cuts, inequalities, that this impacted upon the devastating scale of the death. In retrospect, do you agree as Prime Minister that it would have been wise for you to plan for, for economic impacts of the pandemic? And I mean by that the furloughs and the business schemes. So you had a plan ready-made, off the peg, available to implement so that the government was not left scrabbling around and making ad hoc decisions in very fast time, right at the very moment when they could have better been focusing on other matters like the pandemic. Well, I, I, I just, I'm afraid with great respect, I, I'm not sure I agree with the premise of the question. I mean, the furlough scheme came in very quickly, very boldly, and made an enormous difference. And that was possible because we had the financial capacity to do it. But it proves the point that, you know, for all the plans you can have in the world, until you actually see the nature of the pandemic and how it's developing, planning in advance exactly what your economic responses are going to be is only of, of I would argue, limited use. It would certainly be useful, though, to have an economic response which took into account something that you knew which would happen, which would people would be sick and off work. Yes, but you, what you don't know is, are you going to have a pandemic where people who are symptomatic stay at home, or are you going to have a pandemic where, effectively, the committee, I'm sure, will decide whether it's right or wrong, you have a lockdown and everybody stays at home. So these are two, you know, different types of pandemic requiring two different types of economic response. Despite what you say about planning, do you accept that when the pandemic arrived, the UK still found itself in a situation where essential medical items such as the ventilators, stockpiles of PPE, hygiene, control, were not still readily available? Well, clearly there were problems when the pandemic hit. And I think this does go back to um, identifying the different sorts of pandemic that could hit you and planning for each one. And I, I come back again and again to this issue about, you know, asymptomatic transmission of an easily transmitted virus, <coughs> which is, yes, lethal, but much lower than MERS or lower than Ebola, and that's what we had. And, um, you know, more, if, if more time, if more questions have been asked inside the system or challenging the system about that, then lots of consequences about PPE, and um, about surge capacity and Nightingale hospitals and all the rest of it, a lot of consequences might have followed. So, so we were not only preparing for the wrong pandemic, but the wrong questions were being asked. Can I ask? I, so I think it was more we were, we, we were not, I think it's wrong to say we we're preparing for the wrong pandemic. I mean, there could easily have been, there could still be a pandemic flu, and it's good that we have been prepared for that. But as Oliver Letwin says in his evidence, and George Osborne says in his, and they put it perhaps better than I have, a lot of time was spending, spent preparing for a pandemic that didn't happen rather than the one that did happen. In retrospect, Mr Cameron, do you think that as Prime Minister, your government's failure to plan for the economic impacts on individuals and businesses played any role in the catastrophic loss of lives when the storm of COVID-19 arrived in the UK some four years after your departure? Well, I'm desperately sorry about the loss of life. Um, so many people have lost people that are close to them. And there's been a lot of, of, of heartache, and obviously that continues. And people also suffered in all sorts of ways through the pandemic. And that's why this inquiry is, is so important. Um, I've tried to be as frank as I can and as open as I can about the things my government did that helped put in place the right architecture for looking at these threats, uh, the horizon scanning, the units we put in place, the exercises that were undertaken. But I've also tried to be frank about the you know the things that were missed um and and the thing i struggle with is 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 why they were missed because you know it was not asking questions about asymptomatic transmission of an easily infectious disease with a certain level of lethality that we hadn't seen before but nonetheless might appear um that's that that is you know that is i think where um some of the difficulties flow from. I mean, there's then a whole question of 
how the response is actually managed in practice, which I know the committee will come on to. Milady, I have no further questions. Thank you very much, Ms Mitchell. That concludes Mr Cameron's evidence. Thank you very much for your help, Mr Cameron. Thank you. Thank you. I'm being encouraged to break now, yes, please, so that the stenographer can rest her overworked fingers. Um, I'm also being encouraged to resume at 12.45 and then sit till 1.30, then have lunch. Is that going to cause people serious problems? If it doesn't, uh, then I will return at 12.45. Thank you, my lady. All rise.
I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Um, the question was really where is the permanent secretary yeah. in the general order of things? I'm going to ask you questions about the role of the Department of Health and Social Care. And, and of course, we'll, yeah. we'll go into those issues. Okay. Um, sorry, it's important to the role that you play, but, um, but yes. Um, you do um, uh, largely three things. Uh, so you are chief executive of the uh, organization, which means you uh, lead the, uh, uh, the staff of the uh, uh, department. Uh, you are the chief advisor uh, on policy uh, to the uh, uh, Secretary of uh, uh, State. Uh, and you are the accounting officer for the budgets that Parliament delegates uh, to the uh, 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 to the department. The inquiry has heard evidence that the Department of Health and Social Care was designated as what is known as a responder, in fact, a Category One responder, um, under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004. In fact, the Secretary of State yes. in the Department of Health and Social Care is the designated responder. Can you just assist the inquiry with, with the extent to which it is understood in the department what the extent of those obligations are under the Civil Contingencies Act? Is this an obligation which is placed on the Secretary of State personally, or is it an obligation that is discharged by the p department as a whole? Um, well, legally, the department is an emanation of the uh, Secretary of State. So in almost all cases, the legal powers of the department are um, uh, uh, vested in the Secretary of State personally. Um, Secretaries of State discharge those functions um, normally via uh, their uh, department. So they, so they are effectively individual indivisible. Um, so if you asked people within the department, they would say that the department is a Category 1 uh, responder um, at, uh, in the way that you describe. Now, every Secretary of State has n any number of ministerial obligations, both by way of being in charge of a department, both by way of discharging obligations imposed on him or her under our constitutional structures, but also a fair few number of legal obligations of yep. the type to which I've just made reference under the Civil Contingencies Act. T to what extent are secretaries of state reminded or constantly informed that they are subject to direct legal obligations as well as their normal ministerial obligations? Um, you would normally be... Um, uh, um have your legal re responsibilities explained to you when you come into uh, uh, office. Uh, at, uh, that would be the most uh, uh, important moment. Um, and then, um, obviously, if you're an experienced uh, Secretary of State, uh, you will largely be aware of what your uh, legal responsibilities uh, uh, are. So, as a department, but then directly as the Secretary of State, the the department was under a legal obligation as a Category 1 responder to assess the risk of emergencies occurring, plan for contingency planning, put into place emergency plans and business continuity arrangements, make information available to the public, share information and cooperate with local responders to enhance emergency response coordination and efficiency measures. So there was a a fairly extensive list of specific obligations placed on the department yes, that's in this correct. field of civil contingencies yes, by that's, virtue uh, of the... That, 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 that's correct with one uh, uh, addition. Uh, the other responsibility of the department was to assure itself um, of um, the readiness of other Category 1 uh, uh, responders in this context, uh, mainly NHS England uh, and Public Health uh, England as our two main uh, delivery uh, agents. Uh, and we discharge that function by having a uh, uh, full-time permanent civil servants uh, who work uh, specifically on emergency uh, uh, response, uh, which is uh, in the uh, directorate uh, led by uh, Emma Reid, who I believe the inquiry is going to hear from uh, uh, directly. So how those, how those powers play out in practice is by the allocation of resources within uh, the department of staff whose 
primary responsibility uh, is to um, act as that category one uh, responder. And uh, as we've uh, uh, put in uh, various of our witness statements, there are a whole series of incidents in which they respond in that uh, way. But the insur uh, assurance piece is a very important addition to the list you read out. And do those legal obligations apply to all emergencies or, or just health-related for example, pandemic emergencies? Um, well, there are, uh, um, uh, it's, it's easy to oversimplify, but there are um, things which are clearly a health lead uh, because the heart of the emergency is a, um, uh, uh, is a, uh, is a set of health issues. Uh, for example, the uh, uh, recent monkeypox outbreak, I think, would be in that uh, category. And then there are a large number of things where health is um, one player uh, in um, uh, uh, an emergency that is led from somewhere else. So something like a, a terrorist incident. Um, obviously, there is a health service response, but it's led from elsewhere. Now, I say it's easy to simplify because, of course, the, the nature of emergencies means it's not always that clear cut. So um, uh, the Novichok poisonings, for example, would be an example where there was a clear security lead on the security aspects and then a huge health lead on the health uh, consequences. My question related, in fact, to the legal duties under the Civil Contingencies Act. Those duties apply on a department, as yep. the Secretary of State in relation to any emergency, do they not? Yes. They're not limited to a health emergency, but in yeah. practice, for reasons I'll come on to in a moment, the Department of Health and Social Care is obviously concerned with health. Yes, that's, that's correct. And the reason it's concerned particularly with health emergencies is that under this governmental system of risk identification, risk ownership, and departmental response to emergencies, the DHSC and before the Department of Health was the lead government department relating to pandemic risks. That's correct, yes. Now, lead, lead government department is um, uh, that, that, that's an administrative designation rather than a legal designation. Yes. But, yes. And therefore, as the lead government department, your department was responsible for leading the government's work on, on risks which concerned you directly and for which you had to be responsible, yes. to use a terrible word, risks which you owned. Yes, that's correct. And that meant that you would be involved in the system of risk assessment in relation to pandemics, dealing with other government departments, of course, in relation to how they respond, dealing, of course, with how your own department would respond in the event of a pandemic, and through various other parts of the government, ensuring and I refer there to the Cabinet Office role and the role of the Resilience and Emergencies Division in the Department of Levelling Up and Housing and Communities, making sure that all the other parts of the government do what they're meant to do. That's correct. That's part of the heavy burden of being the lead government department. That's correct. And, of course, in this pandemic, which Milady is inquiring into, your department was the lead government department. Uh, certainly in the uh, planning phase and the initial uh, uh, response, I mean, obviously this becomes a, more of an issue for your, uh, uh, for your second module. It does. Obviously the um, onus of activity moved to a national scale uh, in this particular crisis, as it does in many others. Yes. And may we take it from your answers, therefore, Sir Christopher, that because of this legal obligation, because of the fact that your department was the lead government department, when it came to pandemic-related matters, risks, planned response, planned recovery, anything to do with pandemics, this was during the 10 years leading up to the pandemic of core importance to your department. Um, yes. I mean, obviously, as you said earlier, the department has many, many uh, responsibilities across the uh, health and care uh, uh, sector, which is, of course, a huge sector, but this is one of the very important uh, responsibilities that we hold. Um, in your department, there is a directorate called the EPHP directorate. I think it's the Emergency Preparedness and Health Protection 
Yes. Directorate. Yeah, I mean, it's, um, it's had a variety of names, as I'm sure you've had acronyms, which I'm sure you have uh, uh, identified. But basically, yes, there is a directorate um, that is uh, responsible uh, for emergency preparedness and um, uh, our uh, oversight of health protection, uh, to, um, as you describe, pretty much throughout. Including pandemic preparedness. Yes, correct. Yes. Um, and, and obviously, we've, we've seen that there were a significant number of bodies and entities and boards and so on and so forth, both within your department and also connected to your department, arm's length bodies and so on, who were focusing, or which were focusing, on pandemic influenza preparedness. Yes. So one of them, and we heard evidence of this last week, the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Board, PIP. Was that a DHSC-led programme, or was that a cross-government programme? Uh, that one is uh, the, uh, the DHSC-led uh, programme. Uh, there was a second board, which I'm sure we'll come on to, which was uh, uh, cross-government. And was that PIP board um, chaired, in fact, by Clara Swinson, to whom you've referred, who was the then Director General for Global Health and Health Protection, from whom we'll be hearing perhaps later today, this afternoon? Uh, yes, from the point of her appointment, which I think was towards the end of 2016. And that board first met in October 2007, you may recall. Um, well, I don't, I, I, I don't Take recall, it from me, but I am, I am, told, I am <laughs> right. told by the record. But yes. Okay. Another board was the Pandemic Influenza Preparedness Board. And as we've heard in evidence, that was a board, which was a cross-government board, which was set up by order of the National Security Council, THR, THRC, Threats, Hazards, Resilience and Contingencies Committee, chaired by the then Prime Minister, Theresa May, in 2017. That's correct. And was that a board on, on which the DHSC had a place and yes. which considered directly influenza planning? Yeah, I mean, it was a um, uh, it was the part of um, uh, the follow up to um, the, uh, uh, the Cygnus exercise. Uh, to, um, and it was the main body charged with uh, taking forward uh, the uh, 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 learning and actions from um, uh, uh, that exercise. Uh, and it was co-chaired uh, between the Cabinet Office and uh, DHSC, recognising that there were recommendations that went in directly into uh, uh, the health service uh, and those for uh, wider uh, uh, government. Within the internal management of your department, did the various individuals and, and employees who were contributing to these and other boards report up to, through you, to a departmental board? Um, I'm not sure report up to is the correct uh, terminology. Uh, so, Forgive me. So, uh, well, no, I mean, this is a... Um, uh, I'm not quite sure what the... Right, well, right, well, I'll, 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 but, I'll simply... So, Christopher, will you allow me to rephrase... Or, yeah. well, allow no. me to rephrase the question. Yeah. In your department, as part of its internal management structure, is there an overarching body called the Department? Yes, board? there is. Now, um, as I said earlier, um, all the uh, legal powers are, in fact, vested in the, uh, uh, the Secretary of State. So, departmental boards... And sorry, this is why I was struggling to find the uh, correct words. Uh, they are not like... The boards of arm's length bodies or the boards of private companies or charities in that they do not hold any decision making or ficundary um, uh, responsibilities. So they are legally purely advisory boards to the Secretary of State uh, who exercises all the legal powers. So they are important, but they are important in that advisory function as opposed to being a decision making uh, body. But subject to the legal powers vested in and imposed upon the Secretary of State personally, the departmental board is the most senior board or advisory group within the whole department, is it not? E yes, um, but it's very important to note that that does not mean it is the conduit of advice uh, that goes to the Secretary of State in the vast majority of cases. Um, as I think I set out in my first uh, witness statement, um, the basis of uh, departmental decision making is the submission system uh, to the Secretary of State. So, well, w w what I don't want to give the impression of is that 
um, Secretary of State's decision making is particularly advised by the board, no. which doesn't meet that often. Uh, but you are correct that it is the highest, um, yes. uh, high, highest committee in the department. And, and may I just observe that I didn't suggest that it was a body no, for giving sorry. advice to the Secretary no, I'm of State. Sorry. It is, however, a body which addresses matters of the greatest import, of the greatest importance to the department as a whole. Matters which could imperil the very existence of the department, for example, the major risks to its functioning and its operation, go to that level, do they not? Uh, yes, so, um, the, uh, uh, so the department's risk register um, is a, uh, uh, normally a standing item uh, of the board, and uh, one of the board, and particularly the non-executive members of the board's uh, role, um, is to critique uh, what the department uh, is, uh, uh, is doing uh, on all those uh, issues as a challenge function. As I say, decision-making uh, uh, sits elsewhere. And like many entities and boards, the board has a risk register, which it has half an eye on or a yep. full eye, which tells it which risks pose the greatest threat to the whole entity, the whole department, which risks need to be focused upon by the board, and a register is, of course, kept of where the risks come in the general order of things and what is being done to mitigate those risks. That's, that, 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 that's correct. And in, a as, general, and in, in a general sense. Yeah, and as you correctly uh, identified earlier, what the board does is it sits on top of a structure yes. uh, that assesses uh, those risk and subcommittees that do so. And so the board examines matters that are of the gravest importance to the department, and one such matter it examined by way of a risk deep dive was the issue of major infection diseases, which it did in September of 2016. Uh, yes. Could we have, please, 22738? Departmental Board Risk Deep Dive, dated, we can see, 28th September 2016. And then page two, please, paragraph one. In keeping with the departmental risk guidance, each quarter a risk from the departmental high-level risk register is to be selected for a more in-depth discussion at the departmental board. The aim of the discussion is to consider in more detail the mitigations for a particular risk which might not otherwise be discussed. This quarter, the risk of an outbreak of a major infectious disease has been selected for the first of these risk deep dives. Sir Christopher, it is self-evident that the risks selected for a deep dive will only be those risks which pose the greatest threat to the department. Otherwise, uh, yes, that's correct. For a deep and um, and uh, as he's uh, shown in this presentation, there were in fact two risks uh, to, uh, that uh, uh, fell into this category. One, which was the uh, uh, risk of uh, uh, an influenza pandemic, uh, and one was what is known as uh, the risk of a high consequence uh, infectious, infectious disease. disease. And at the bottom of the page, we can see the key question for the departmental board is. How much money, time and effort do we want to invest in our insurance against these risks? And the blurb sets out how the National Risk Assessment, that's no longer in existence because it was done away with and combined into the National Security Risk Assessment in 2019, to which my lady has had reference, sets out a very severe reasonable worst case scenario for pandemic flu. There was then a debate about the substantial expenditure on countermeasures. And then at the second bullet point, in the event of a major disease outbreak, the, the Department of Health, because you were known as the Department of Health then, and then the directorate to which you've already made uh, reference, the EPHPP directorate would be very rapidly overwhelmed. Should we do more to raise awareness of the risk and to plan for immediate mobilization of a large number of staff? And then this, the lack of a national forum to support and oversee planning and response in the social care sector poses challenges. Is there more that can be done to provide direction and strength and coordination? So important, serious issues were being raised in the department yep. for consideration by its highest level board in this deep dive, all related to, in broad terms, pandemic planning. That is correct. Uh, I, I would say pandemic and high-consequence infectious disease planning, yes. which are separate. 
but related. The that is the uh, the minute, or rather the um, the presentation. Um, if we could just have a quick look at page eight, please, on the document. And if you could zoom in, please. Some figures were provided to the board on the likely consequences of a severe pandemic. 30 million people symptomatic, 300,000 to 1.2 million requiring hospital care, 75,000 to 300,000 requiring critical care, peak illness, 7.2 million people. Impact on the economy, massive, lost working hours, huge, societal disruption, extensive. Could we have the minutes, please, of the meeting, 57271? This was a meeting dated the 29th of September, so one day later, at which these points were discussed. Departmental Board Draft Minutes, present Chris Wormold. That's you, of course, and members of your team. Apologies, Jeremy Hunt, Secretary of State for Health. Could we have, please, page one? Chris Wormald opened the meeting, noting apologies from members. There was no ministerial attendance due to the House of Commons summer recess and the upcoming party conference season. And then page three, please. And the second bullet point. Members agreed that the effectiveness of the board was linked to ministerial engagement as much as it was to executive and non-executive engagement. It was thought the balance between executive and non-executive and mistrial members was important, though there was a level of ambivalence amongst executive members at the proposed reduction of their membership. Some suggested it may be appropriate for them to attend the board for the discussions on performance, risk and horizon scanning. And then the next bullet point, please. Members were concerned by the Secretary of State's continuing lack of engagement with the board. Chris Wormald explained to members that ministerial attendance at the Department for Education Departmental Board had been compulsory and enforced by the Secretary of State. He also advised that ministerial code requires Secretaries of State to chair their departmental boards. On the proposal that the Secretary of State nominate a junior minister to chair in his absence, members noted that both David Pry and Philip Dunn had appropriate board level experience. What steps did you take to ensure that the Secretary of State for your department attended future board meetings addressing matters of the highest importance, such as pandemic planning? Um, I don't recall having a specific conversation uh, with uh, uh, the Secretary of State uh, on that point, and I don't have a record of, uh, uh, of doing so. Uh, the Secretary of State would have been aware of the meeting and would also have um, uh, been um, uh, shown the minutes of the meeting, I, I assume. But as I say, I don't have a record uh, of uh, directly speaking to the Secretary of State about that matter. This was a board that you were the ex officio head of, at least by virtue of your name being first on the list of attendees. At that meeting, members expressed concern about the Secretary of State's continuing lack of engagement. Why was that not a matter that you brought to his direct and immediate attention in this issue? Um, it's, very, it, it's very difficult to comment on a, uh, uh, a negative. As I say, I don't recall um, having a conversation. We undoubtedly had conversations about the board. Um, I don't recall um, at, um, uh, discussing this particular uh, uh, board meeting. Uh, so we definitely had conversations about the board uh, and ministerial attendance. As I say, I don't recall uh, raising this one uh, specifically. It can't be very usual, Sir Christopher, for members of the departmental board to express concern about their own Secretary of State. Um, no, I don't think it, uh, uh, I don't think it is. So why didn't you bring it to his specific attention? Um, as I say, um, I don't have a record of uh, 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 doing so, um, and uh, I therefore cannot recall what was um, at, uh, um, uh, what was my thought process at the uh, 
uh, uh, at the time. I, I, I hesitate to guess what I was thinking, but I suspect I was uh, thinking that I would deal with it in the general rather than the specific, but that is a... Um, uh, um, uh, that is my post hoc rationalisation. By which you mean? Well, as I say, we were um, at. Uh, uh, I remember having discussions uh, with the Secretary of State about the board in the, in general, um, and um, I suspect I was thinking that was the best way to address uh, the issue rather than. Uh, a discussion about this specific uh, uh, board meeting. As I say, I don't have a record of uh, having done that, so I can't claim that I did. Page six, please. And then further down the page, Just a little bit further up, please. I'm sorry, too far down. Paragraph 24, the department had been planning for a major outbreak or pandemic for many years, and the United Kingdom is recognised as one of the most prepared countries in the world. For example, it had invested more in antiviral stockpiles than most other countries. The antiviral stockpiles was in the main Tamiflu, the brand name for an anti-influenza pandemic. Antiviral. Is that correct? Uh, that's my understanding, yes. So, although it had invested more in antiviral stockpiles than most other countries, the stockpiles for antivirals was concerned only with providing a countermeasure to pandemic influenza. Uh, in that case, yes. yes. The department is taking part in Exercise Cygnus, which would take place between October and the 20th of October, and be modelled on a pandemic scenario. It had been cancelled twice. We'll come to Cygnus in a moment. One paragraph further down, please. It was more likely than not that not even than that it was more likely than not that even a moderate pandemic would overrun the system. At the extreme, there would be significant issues if it became necessary to track or quarantine thousands of people. A decision to fund high-end quarantine facilities had already been deferred by ministers. So, Christopher, we will look in detail over the next two hours on what steps were taken by the department between now and 2016 and 2020 when the pandemic struck. Would you agree that by January of 2020, the system was not even then capable of dealing with even a moderate pandemic? Um I would have quite a nuanced answer uh, well, to that question. Um, sorry. Please, Mr. Chairman. You can always come back. Yes, indeed. Questions. Please answer. Uh, sorry. At, um, uh, I think a, a significant number of steps uh, had been uh, uh, taken um, at the time, um, and um, this comes out in the uh, uh, paragraph that you. Uh, emphasised uh, before, uh, we believed uh, that we had uh, uh, good uh, and very good by international standards uh, uh, procedures uh, in uh, uh, place, um, and I believe that those were uh, rational things to think given the evidence, uh, advice and resources that we had uh, at the time. Um, if you ask me now, uh, with the benefit of uh, uh, hindsight of having dealt uh, with the pandemic, um, there are a, uh, uh, well, a, a, a large number of things uh, that I would have wanted to have added, as it were, but that is with the benefit of uh, hindsight. So I would distinguish between what we thought was rational uh, at the time, which was, as I say, set out in the, uh, uh, the previous paragraph that you uh, uh, said, and, um, and what we would think now based on what we now know. Uh, the other thing I would add about uh, this, um, and this may have been an error, but it was certainly what we uh, thought, was um, an awful lot of our thinking, uh, and the thinking that was in place when I arrived at the department was focused on uh, the Cygnus uh, exercise, 
and that is where we expected uh, uh, all these questions to go into that exercise uh, and the uh, uh, follow-up. I'm sorry, I'm sorry that's a sort of nuanced answer, but I'm trying to set out what, what, what I think we thought at the time and why separately from what we now think uh, is an appropriate way forward, if that is, if that, if that is um, uh, uh, understandable. So, Christopher, it forms no part of this inquiry to examine, with hindsight, what other decisions could have been made, or were made, or were not made. But in 2016, this departmental board was warning, in the clearest terms, it was more likely than not that even a moderate pandemic would overrun the system. So there is no issue of hindsight here. That was a prospective warning that the system would likely not cope. Um, yes, which is exactly why uh, there was the proposal uh, uh, and indeed the, uh, uh, the actuality of Exercise Cygnus. Yes. Exercise Cygnus, paragraph six of its final report, said this. The UK's preparedness and response in terms of its plans, policies and capability were not sufficient to cope with the extreme demands of a severe pandemic that would have a United Kingdom-wide impact across all sectors. So Exercise Cygnus did not come in any way to relieve the problem that was identified in paragraph 25. It reported again that systemically the system would not be sufficient. So what was done after Cygnus to ensure that the system would be sufficient? Um, well, there was a whole programme uh, of work post uh, Cygnus that we have uh, mentioned already, uh, led by the um, uh, uh, Pandemic uh, Influenza Preparedness Board that we discussed earlier, the Cross-Government Board, um, whose job it was to take forward uh, the, uh, uh, the findings uh, of, the, um, uh, uh, of the exercise. Could we have, please, paragraph 26? All decisions in response to an outbreak or pandemic would need to be made by the department as a department of state, though arm's length bodies would have their role to play. There were, however, concerns about how resilient the somewhat fragmented system would be, especially in light of previous or future funding cuts. By January 2020, the system remained fragmented, did it not? Um, its legal structure, um, as set out in the uh, 2012 Act and uh, the 2014 uh, CARE Act, uh, the two governing pieces of uh, uh, legislation hadn't changed, no. The legal structure under that Act and the legal structure under the Civil Contingencies Act 2004 had not materially altered, had it? Uh, those, so so the, the two acts, which is, were the governing acts of how we run the system, the 2012 Act and the 2014 Act for Health and then uh, Social Care, uh, remained in place, yes. And then, uh, as you know, the Civil Contingents Act hadn't changed. The whole system of having a lead government department, having local authorities and local resilience forums being supervised and liaised with by the Resilience and Emergencies Division of the Department of Levelling Up and... Housing in communities hadn't changed? No. The Cabinet Office position hadn't changed through its resilience directorate. It sought to exercise control by political persuasion and other means over other government departments. Um, a little more than political persuasion, but no, it hadn't uh, changed. The Department of Health and Social Care was responsible for the funding and the general guidance funding of and general guidance for local authorities, but of course local authorities who are concerned with the social adult social care sector fall out with the direct functions of your department. Uh, that's correct. So um, the 2014 uh, Care Act, uh, which um, broadly maintained uh, the um, uh, previous uh, arrangements for uh, adult social care uh, sets out that it is a, uh, a, a local authority led and funded um, uh, service. So it's not, it's, it's not correct we oversaw the funding. Uh, the funding is uh, locally raised um, and it gives a, um, 
uh, quite a limited set of powers to um, um, uh, uh, to central uh, government, uh, mainly uh, through uh, the inspection of care providers, uh, not uh, uh, not local authority commissioners. I say because that is something we've. Uh, 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 we have uh, uh, changed. Uh, so it was a largely locally led uh, system with the department having uh, uh, responsibilities around the legal framework and around the uh, 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 inspection uh, as uh, uh, implemented by CQC. And so, Sir Christopher, having therefore accepted that in no significant regard had there been any change to the fragmented nature of the system as of 2016, would you agree that the system remains similarly fragmented still by January 2020? Um, as I say, the, so the, the legal position uh, on all those matters uh, had not changed. In this board meeting, Sir Christopher, concerns weren't being expressed about the dry nature of the legal obligations being placed on the various parts of the government machine concern was being expressed about how resilient the somewhat fragmented system would be, whether it would cope in practical terms. That wasn't just an issue about legal obligations, was it? Uh, no, no. Um, I was answering the uh, specific question you uh, So asked. there were no changes, were there, significantly, to how resilient the system would be between 2016 and 2020? It remained fragmented. Uh, that's true. In Thank you. And you are accepting it was fragmented. I got the feeling that maybe you weren't accepting, Sir Christopher, it was fragmented. Um, I don't think there is um, uh, uh, any, uh, uh, any dispute uh, that it was fragmented. And indeed, um, the, um, uh, the whole point uh, of the 2012 uh, Act uh, was to uh, reduce uh, the level of central control uh, over particularly the uh, uh, NHS um, and uh, to run the system uh, much more as a, uh, uh, and I apologise for using the jargon, as a quasi-market. So the idea of that act was um, to um, uh, have operational freedom within the NHS um, and uh, for the system to be uh, uh, based around a series of commissioners uh, and providers as opposed to a top-down uh, system of uh, direct control as, as had existed prior to uh, 2012. Now, whether... Um, uh, whether you believe fragmented to be a good or a bad thing, I don't think there's any dispute that that was the purpose uh, of that uh, uh, set of reforms. Uh, so there, Mr. In terms of, I ought, to cover, I ought to cover social care as well. Just do where, finish, where, do where, finish the thought and then we'll pause. Yeah, where, again, um, uh, it's not a matter of dispute uh, that um, social care is a locally run service and therefore divided amongst the... Uh, 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 top tier uh, local authorities uh, as again, again you can debate whether that is a good thing or a bad thing but I don't think it's in doubt that it's a thing and there we must leave it well unless you particularly wanted to do anything else on this topic well, as it happens I had one more question on well, this document and then perhaps we can put it to one side yeah. paragraph 25 there would be significant issues if it became necessary to track or quarantine thousands of people is this the position, Sir Christopher, that despite that issue, the important issue of quarantining being raised in 2016, by January 2020, whilst there was and had been a continual debate as to how to isolate individuals in the event of a high-consequence infectious disease, there was and there never was any debate about mass quarantining, mass isolation, mass quarantining. Was that? Um, well, in the uh, influenza plan, uh, at, um, um, the basis of uh, that uh, is a series of uh, 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 voluntary, uh, what are known as MPIs, um, which uh, would have included uh, those issues. What there was so, not. Christopher, I'm so sorry to, to interrupt. Yeah. Quarantining is, as you know, of course, 
a mandatory thing. It's a mandatory restriction. Was there any debate between now, the issue having been raised in 2020, of mandatory quarantining of significant numbers of the population? Uh, not in the context of a pandemic. Well, we're not really concerned with quarantining outside the pandemic in this inquiry. So the answer yeah. is no. Um, not in the context of the pandemic. I'm sure we will come on to, but there are important in interactions uh, between the uh, strategy for high consequence infectious diseases and the uh, 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 and the uh, plans for a pandemic, um, which I'm sure we will uh, discuss further. I think you said the issue hadn't been raised in 2020. I think you meant 2016. Thank you. I did. Uh, very well. We shall come back at 20 plus two, please.